The Chan Zuckerberg Biohub was founded in part on the principles that we can do more together than on our own. And therefore, that core element of the Biohub is our close partnership with UCSF, Stanford, and UC Berkeley, our institutional partners. And so that in mind, I'm really thrilled to bring you to this last this last segment of our symposium, the, the you know, quote, fireside chat with our uh, partners. And so we're incredibly unfortunate today to have with us a Chancellor Carol Christ from the University of California, Berkeley, Chancellor Sam Hawgood of the University of California, San Francisco, President Emeritus and Biohub board member, John Hennessy, and last but not least, President Mark Tesla Levine of Stanford University. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Great to be here. It's great to have you all here. And you know, for those of us that have been part of academic research here in the Bay Area, I think we all appreciate that it's sometimes different to work, difficult to work across the cultural and structural barriers, whether real or perceived, among the three tremendous universities. Um, and you know, this is something we tried to solve from the beginning and trying to articulate what this relationship would be between the universities and the biohub was central to the whole creation process of the biohub. And let's start with maybe John and Sam, um, because you two uh, were, were so essential that your leadership and your direct discussions with Mark and Priscilla um, were just key to making it all happen. And what uh, you can reminisce a little bit and also just pose the question, what were the challenges and risks that the universities took in helping create the biohub and how do you feel that's worked out? Well, John, I'll, I'll kick it off, and you can start, you can uh, correct me as I go. But uh, uh, we we were co-conspirators back there with uh, lots of conversation, and 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 it, there was a lot of sausage making. To be honest, this was this was something new, not because it was uh, not because collaborations hadn't occurred between UCSF and Stanford in the past, but the scale and the aspiration of this particular wow. vision that Mark and Priscilla put in front of us uh, was new. And um, it really challenged us to, to think out of the box. I, I had just recently become chancellor and one of the aspirations that I set for myself during my chancellorship, and it continues today, is, is to recognize that the really big problems in science um, go beyond the boundaries of any one institution, no matter how great that institution is. And, and you know, I, I, I use, Internally, I use the words transformational partnerships are key to the future of UCSF. We, we only do life sciences and, and, and healthcare delivery, as you all know. Um, and so we need partnerships to uh, bring in the power of other disciplines, computer science, engineering in all its forms, pure mathematics, all of these disciplines that we've heard so much about today. Um, and so it was almost a a critical part of our future. And this was a tremendous experiment. And so it was very exciting to sit down and start with the vision, which I think was key, and not start with the problems. You, you get to the problems soon enough, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of those. But I, I found it incredibly innovating and um, exciting to, to work with John. And I, I would say that the model that we started with looked very different. To the model we ended up with. And I'm glad we took the time along with Mark and Priscilla to talk to others around the country, to you know, spend hours and hours with you, Joe and Steve, and craft something that I, I think what we've heard today actually works. The five years has been very exciting. I, I may be um, looking at the past through rose-colored glasses, but uh, John, what, what would you add to that? Uh, that's a good summary, Sam. I, I think, and this is really a tribute to Joe and Steve's leadership, because I think from the beginning, they thought about how does the biohub be an add to what the universities already have, rather than something that could become competitive or created, which some of the other institutes in the country have uh, created those kinds of tensions, shall we say. So that was important. I think the other the other thing we we thought hard about was really thinking about building up collaboration. There's always been one-off collaborations, right? My closest colleague is a Berkeley, longtime Berkeley faculty member. So there's always been one-off. But I think what was interesting about the Biohub is we asked, could we get collaboration to a higher scale 
and really strengthen the contribution that the Bay Area was making in, in biology research and biomedical research. And I think that that's one of the great successes here, I think we have to say. That's great. You know, uh, I think that uh, Carol and Mark, that you both came into this as the process was already unfolding and rolling. And I wonder if you could give us some reflections about maybe how has the BioHub changed the way you think around collaboration in the Bay Area, not just in the sciences, but among the universities. Well, I, uh, we have at Berkeley a challenge that's almost the mirror image of UCSF's. Uh, we don't have a medical school and so much research, not just in the life sciences, but in engineering and technology depends on closeness to clinical trials, depends on closeness to clinical delivery. So um, uh, the, the BioHub is giving us an opportunity to develop this collaboration that's so essential to Berkeley moving forward. The, uh, maybe I can echo um, uh, what John said. The, the, there have always been lots of bilateral interactions between the institutions. If I reflect on my own career, I, I started at UCSF and my closest collaborator was at Berkeley. Uh, then I moved to Stanford. Um, so I've, I've had the, the benefit of interacting with scientists um, at all institutions, but it's sort of a, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, so, and we know that all three of our campuses are very collegial. Our, the Bay Area is very collegial. It's a California thing. But unless you put mechanisms in place to enable, to grease the wheels of interactions, they, they may not happen. And what the BioHub has really done, when I, I came here and the BioHub had just started, um, I, I think we started the same day, um, right? Uh, I think Mark, uh, it was the first thing, one of the it first- was my, It was my very there. first uh, event. The, I was just so thrilled um, that uh, 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 one of the, uh, uh, to make science work, you have to put systems in place and you have to be very uh, careful um, and, and thoughtful about the social engineering you build into it. So the fact that your investigators have to come to the biohub very frequently and meet the other investigators um, uh, has enabled uh, scientists here to meet their colleagues at the other institutions and uh, created the opportunity for collaborations, yes, in the near term, but also in the long term. Uh, so these are colleagues who now know one another who might not have met uh, previously. So you're, you're providing a substrate for collaboration. And that's uh, in addition to uh, actual collaborations that have occurred. And uh, what's wonderful about that is that it, it enables us as a community in the Bay Area to contribute more to advancing science, to applying science, to having the impact that we all want to have on the world. So it's been a great amplifier of what we have here. Um, also, so that's uh, great in terms of doing good in the world. Uh, also, it's a competitive world out there. And, uh, um, you know, we are, uh, uh, the Bay Area, competing with other uh, places that are making massive investments. And if we want to continue to be able to recruit the best and the brightest, um, we need to um, also uh, be on the world stage. And being together, we can do so much more than alone. Um, so I think it's added tremendously uh, by enriching our interactions and enabling us to do more and go further. Terrific. And, you know, we heard earlier today from both Harold Varmus and Francis Collins about the relationship between philanthropy and federal funding of research and, and you know, they're very complementary to each other. And from your perspectives as university leaders, how do you see that relationship? Because obviously we're much smaller than the federal funding to the universities, but uh, play perhaps a role that, that is not filled by conventional grants. What I keep hearing from our faculty is that uh, philanthropic funding of research is often better designed to enable them to take risks and um, and to um, and to work not in the sense of I'm going to do this and uh, you know and these are the results I'm going to produce, but rather to um, make some uh, risky bets. I would agree, Carol, and. Um... You know, philanthropy generally is is more open and less restrictive in terms of specifics. So it allows faculty to follow the leads um, and not be thinking whether this is setting themselves up for the next grant, but it, it allows them just to pursue where the science is going in a much more flexible and fluid manner. Um, the, the other place that philanthropists obviously play a huge role on all three of our campuses is to help us uh, build the world-class facilities that world-class scientists need. So in addition to the specific funding for research, uh, philanthropists that have an interest in 
facilities um, certainly certainly helps us all, I think, build the kind of uh, facilities that, that we need. Uh, I, I think philanthropy has become a key part of thinking about the future of funding science, both, both because of the pressure on the federal agencies there, they naturally become slightly more risk averse when there's so much competition. Uh, I, so I think it's gonna be valuable. And I think one of the roles the Biohub will play in the future as we bring more philanthropists into the science tent is really talking to them about how to set these up in a way that they can be really ultra successful like the Biohub has been. And that's something, that's an important role uh, that we've seen play in other foundations and institutions around the country. So there'll be that role in the future. I, mean, I just agree that the, the, the philanthropy is essential. Uh, it's an essential complement to the, the NIH, which has its role. Um, and uh, where it is most valuable is at these leverage points, um, enabling faculty to take risks, which the system otherwise won't ena uh, enable them, as, as Sam said, the facilities. Um, and, and also, um, uh, I think certain types of projects um, that, uh, especially collaborative projects, uh, and the, the kinds of things that you're doing at the Biohub, for example, um, to, to tackle problems that don't fit neatly within the NIH framework, uh, but that require significant resources to tackle them and create tools and information that are valuable to the entire community. Um, so philanthropy has an essential role to play there as well, again, complementing what the NIH does well. I, I would just add, and I, I think I heard uh, Harold uh, mentioned this in his keynote earlier today that um, uh, Mark and Priscilla, I think, need a huge amount of uh, credit um, for the the thoughtful way they approached philanthropy. You know, they they had an idea, but they were very open and, in fact, sought out um, extraordinary counsel over a prolonged period of time before they locked that idea down, and uh, were willing to willing to hear from the academic and scientific community uh, what ideas were likely to work and what ideas would probably not work even if they sounded good at the time. So I, I, to me, that's one of the key reasons why the Biohub has been such a huge success. The, the thoughtfulness that went into the planning and the openness of the donors um, to, to, to take all of that advice and distill it down to something that made sense for them. You know, uh, I was uh, I was actually a graduate student at, at Stanford in the biochemistry department in the 90s. And I can remember uh, an attempted collaboration between UCSF and Stanford in the 90s there that may not have gone as well as one had hoped. Uh, and we don't have to reflect on that past in any great detail. But I wonder if, you know, this the, the four of you could maybe reflect on uh, on, on what are some of the key challenges for others that may want to do this kind of collaboration among universities. We've talked a lot here about what's gone well. What are the pitfalls? What, what are the things that maybe you've learned that others can avoid? Well, I think one real success here was starting with the faculty and what would work well for the faculty of the institutions. And maybe that's what was wrong with that earlier attempt. It, it couldn't because of its very nature, be a merger between a public and private, couldn't start by telling all our faculty colleagues what was happening, because um, it never would have it never would have gotten off base one. So that that's key, and I think we all see that um, when you try to get faculty to collaborate, you can you can add a little inducement, but really, they're gonna they're gonna find the best way to get their work done. And if collaborating is better, they'll collaborate and, and we can grease the wheel and make that easier. If collaboration is, is an interference, is an overhead, then they're not going to do it um, because they're fairly independent individuals. I do think that the, the um, so the, the, uh, the agreement that created the, the, the Biohub and the interaction with the, the three universities, I believe was the first tripartite um, uh, formal interaction, right? It was the first uh, agreement among our three uh, universities. And the, the uh, importance of that is it's an existence proof, right? It shows that it can be done. So that, uh, Joe, your question was, uh, if, you know, if others come along and want to uh, uh, encourage something between the three universities, they know it can be done. 
Um, and uh, I think it, it just paves the way for additional agreements, whether formal or informal. Um, we've, uh, uh, during COVID, um, you know, Sam and I uh, spent a lot of time together in a non-formal way without a written document, um, working on uh, forging a collaboration between our two universities to tackle COVID. Uh, in this case, in fact, it was prompted again uh, by uh, uh, Priscilla uh, and Mark, who had expressed an interest in seeing whether the universities could come together. Um, and that led to a wonderful collaboration around uh, 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 epidemiology of, of COVID um, uh, that's produced lots of very uh, valuable data um, uh, through the course of the pandemic. Um, so I, th I think it's it's really, um, uh, the, with the Biohub you, and, and this um, uh, agreement, you broke through that um, barrier that might have existed, and it's just going to facilitate interactions in the future. So uh, you really deserve a lot of credit for that as well. Yeah. I also think that it was really important that it was one agreement and not three agreements, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that that created a level of trust and transparency. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was critical. And also, you managed to finesse the problems of the extraordinarily different appointment structures the three of us have um, with the, with the it, it, it investigator kind of appointment that the Biohub created. Well, we're glad to hear it's working so well on your sides as well. And uh, coming back to this topic of collaboration, which you guys raised, um, and something you know we've been working hard to do, Ron Vale just gave a great talk and, you know, kind of raised the question of how do you give credit in larger collaborations? And maybe I pose that question to you for as you think about how you promote faculty, how do you take that into account? Faculty has been very collaborative as you're trying to figure out who to promote within the universities. <clears throat> well, I think the physicists solved that, right? <laughs> Years ago, you have collaborations where they will, there'll be 3000 authors on a paper. Um, and a lot of them are junior faculty who are, you know, looking to uh, get promoted, get tenure. Um, and so, uh, and it, I, I think what the physicists figured out is sort of what, where Ron ended in his talk, which is you don't put on your CV, you know, 3000 authors and highlight your name and bold your number 1,578, right? What you do is you describe your role, you describe the contribution uh, and you make that very clear. So um, I, I think that we can actually uh, look to the physicists for uh, good lessons, but I think a lot of them are already embedded in what Ron was describing at the end of his talk. Yeah, I would agree. I, I like the concept that Ron brought up that, uh, you know, it's not, not about the number of publications or where you are on the authorship list, but it's what, what was actually accomplished and what your role, much as Mark was just saying. And I think we're a ways away from that. I think most of our academic reviews are still, you know, they're, they're under a lot of pressure. They're not going to go and read the articles themselves. So they're, they're left looking at the author list and, and the credibility of the journal. Um, so I, I think a lot of Ron's ideas really resonated with me. Um, advancement committees are, you know, they're, they're not the fastest moving group in the world. So I think they're going to need uh, a lot of um, support and pushing from, from leaderships of key institutions to, to drive the change that Ron was suggesting. That's and I great. think a lot of us have moved to this model of, of when a, a candidate for 10 comes up for tenure, prepare a dossier that tells you what are your five or six most important publications and a short paragraph why they are. And that's what goes out then to people who we're getting requests for references from. I think that that's very helpful models like that. You know, I remember a case early on, uh, I had a junior colleague I was collaborating with and people said, oh, he's got five papers jointly with Hennessy. This is terrible, you know? And so I wrote back, I said, take those five papers out and vote on the case as it stands. And of course, this is individual and collaborate with a lot, but he, he collaborated with different people, bringing something unique to each individual contribution. And that became clear as people looked more carefully at his contributions. Terrific. Yeah. You know, uh, just thinking ahead here, you know, we've talked about a little bit about the past in the last five years and, I'm wondering, just from your from all um, all four of your perspectives, you know what what are the challenges in the on the horizon post pandemic here for research at universities, both philanthropy, federal funding, the competitiveness to hire new faculty, 
There are many challenges one might see, but I'd love, I think our audience would really like to hear from all of you what you think are the key challenges that lay ahead. You know, I, I think not all faculty have been impacted by the pandemic in the same way. And I particularly reference uh, those uh, scientific research faculty who have had to bear significant dependent care responsibilities during the pandemic with schools out and elder care uh, or child care. And I think it has led to um, uh, at least putting much of the strong progress that's been made in terms of particularly gender equality over the last decade um, at some risk. So I think we have to think hard about that. Um, we've recently just released policies that um, we, we initially sort of said that we would put a pandemic hold the clock policy in place, meaning give everyone extra time. But we got strong feedback from the faculty that they weren't looking for extra time. They were looking for to be promoted, but to have some recognition of the consequences of the pandemic. So we've tried to capture that in, in our advancement policies that will be in place at least for the next three to four years as the tail of the pandemic has effect. Um, so, so I worry about um, uh, the loss of ground and in, in equity, um, both both gender and, and, and other equity, particularly on those who have had care dependencies. I think some faculty are questioning is, is the, you know, rough and tumble of, of the uh, academic environment worth it when they see other opportunities in, in, in uh, either in industry or some of these new models that are popping up. So I think we need to be very mindful of that and continue to really put support behind what, what makes the great universities of which I think we consider the three that are on the screen today uh, as a member of that, what, what makes them so special and think very intentionally about that and make sure that doesn't go away as a consequence of the stresses of the last two years. One of the things I worry about a lot from the perspective of a public university is the adequacy of capital funding. We see it all the time. We see it in aging facilities, in, um, in the an, an enormously expensive demands of, of, of complex um, scientific projects and not other than philanthropy, not easy sources for that capital funding. I, I agree. The, the, um, uh, we both have to support the faculty who have been through a very difficult time um, in uh, faculty and also our, our students and postdocs, of course, and, and staff, uh, difficult time with COVID. Um, but then we have to make uh, this an exciting career opportunity. And that means uh, access to adequate facilities, uh, adequate resources, uh, including for risky work. And that's, we talked about the role of philanthropy there. Um, and, uh, and I agree with, with Carol, the uh, research instruments are so important. Um, and then also access to, uh, you know, to facilitate interactions with other scientists as we move to a world where collaborations are going to be more and more important to tackle really big problems. Uh, so universities have a, a but, but if we're going to be successful going forward, we have to make it exciting so people want to stay here to, 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 uh, to Sam's point, because there are other opportunities uh, for people um, who have this kind of uh, background and expertise. And I, and I think Mark made the point earlier that the, the Biohub over the last five years has shown that the three universities can work together. And the more we think about that so that we can supplement each other um, versus redundancies on the three campuses, you know, particularly in some of these very high expense uh, instrumentations and, and facilities, highly specialized facilities that it might be adequate if they're available at one of our campuses, but they don't have to be available on every campus if we can break through some of the collaborative issues. Yeah, I think we're in an interesting time because I think if I look at my colleagues in computer science who find themselves competing with industry with far more resources and capability, both in terms of computational resources, data access, I think things like the Biohub are likely to become more important because instrumentation Specialized instrumentation has got so expensive, big data is really critical in, in biomedicine as it is in, in computer science. So I think we're going to need more models like this that provide a level of support and facility 
uh, that can enable the universities to continue their work in a, in a fruitful way. Terrific. Th thank you all um, for your partnership with the BioHub, which Joe and I greatly appreciate, and for your time today to reflect on the last five years. We, we hope it's going to be even more productive uh, working together going forward. Yes, congratulations. It's support. been a great five years. And, and, yeah. and Steve, before we do close, I know it was mentioned earlier. Um, I, I truly believe that this wouldn't have happened without you two particular individuals as, as leaders. You've, you've worked extraordinarily well together and you've made it easy for us as institutional leaders to get behind the vision of the Biohub. So I want to thank the both of you because I imagine there's been a few tough days here and there in the last five years, but you, you, you've never let on and you've just done a terrific job. Thank, thank you. you. It's been our privilege. It's been our privilege. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. <clears throat> So with that, we're approaching the end of the day and we'd like to thank all of our speakers and discussion panelists today for their engaging and thoughtful participation. Absolutely, you know, ranging from motile influenza viruses, dark matter and mosquitoes, new technologies in neuroscience, the compendium of single cell genomics known as the tabula projects, all as well as the incredible resource of open cell. This has just been a small taste of what we do here at the BioHub and one I hope that you've all enjoyed. Indeed, and we'd like to again thank all of the employees and investigators of the BioHub, the team at CZI, GMMB, and as well as our partner universities um, who all pulled together to make this day possible. Thank you to our audience that joined us throughout the day and for many who stuck with us throughout the entire day to the very end. And, and for any of those that missed anything or any of the talks today, all of this will be posted on our website at czbiohub.org later this week. And last but not least, uh, we'd like to thank Mark and Priscilla for their amazing support and confidence in us and the team here at the BioHub. Thank you, truly. Thank you everyone for attending this fifth anniversary celebration. These five years have been an incredible adventure and we're just getting started. I'll say. <laughs> Bye now. Okay, that's a wrap. <clears throat>